A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vignesh, and it's truly a pleasure for me to be your moderator and MC for today's talk. To those of you who are joining us online, thank you very much for making the time early on a Saturday morning of a long weekend to be with us. And for those of you in the room, thank you so much for joining us during today's session. Today is a very special day for us at the Head Foundation, as today's session is not just brought by the Head Foundation, but brought, brought to us together with a fantastic social movement, the best of you. This THF Dialogue and Conversations Reimagined, organized by the Head Foundation and the best of you, is a session that we hope will get you to think more deeply about some of the challenges that we face here in Singapore in our education system. Time poverty, responsabilization, adultification. Those of you who joined us in person would have seen these three words plastered on boards outside this auditorium. For those of you who are joining us online, we'll share more about it later. But these three terms, what do they mean? Time poverty, all of us are busy. But what is it like if you're a young person whose schedule is jam-packed? You have no opportunities to be a child, to live, to grow, to experience, to feel. Responsabilization. Is it everything your fault? Is it all about your own individual responsibility? Or is there more at play? How do young people grapple and deal with this? Adultification. Can you imagine a young person, a young child, having to look after, raise their siblings, care for them, provide for them, take on the responsibilities of an adult. But many living in our midst today in Singapore too, they face all three of this. So if a child is saddled with all these challenges, do you think that they have a fair chance at excelling in their studies? Is education in Singapore truly an equal start? On the 10th of April, when our president opened the second session of this parliament, she did emphasize the importance for the government to rethink its approach to education so that privileges do not become entrenched. The idea of entrenched privilege is something that is an antithesis to what we believe in as Singaporeans with meritocracy. But what can we do? What more can we do to change the system? So ladies and gentlemen, we want to address some of this. We want to ponder about it. We want to think. But importantly, by the end of today's session, I hope we're able to learn from the rich empirical data, to hear voices working on the ground, to analyze what are the existing infrastructure, and hopefully to propose new ways that we can move forward as a country to ensure equality of opportunity for everyone. To start today's session, I'd like to invite the CEO of the Head Foundation, Dr. Wang Changda, to deliver his opening message. Dr. Changda, please. Very good morning. Welcome to this edition of the THF Dialogue. Please pardon my sexy voice. I just lost my voice a couple of days back, so I'm slowly regaining it. And it's very apt that we are also talking about voices of uh, people in education as uh, the part of the topic today. Um, this is a very special edition of the THF Dialogues, the Head Foundation Dialogues that we are doing in partnership with the best of you, re -imagine, a conversation reimagine. I believe no one among us here will deny that education is a human right. Every child should have the right to education. And one of the most basic components of education to every child is access to schooling. Um, and that is one of the most fundamental and in most developing systems or, or developed and developing systems, including in Singapore, this is not a serious problem. But this is insufficient as we begin to think about just education through access to schooling. And this is where it becomes a very tall order for us as we think about um, the essential conversations of education and schooling. That is, how do we ensure that every child not only gets to go to school, 
but to be able to make full use of the benefit of schooling and education to unleash their potential and to turn them into um, citizenry of that is of that is able to contribute to society and to the head foundation this is which have a mission and vision to improve lives through quality education this is a topic that is very dear and relevant to our work in education and i look forward today uh, to dr shalin Cheong, who is going to share with us some of her insights from her PhD dissertation and research work done here in Singapore, as well as an eminent panelist who is going to unpack the issue of both um, not only access that we are talking about, but equitable equity, as well as how do we ensure that every child who goes to school and goes through the education system will be able to unleash their potential. And and also want to once again take this opportunity to thank Zihong, Celine, and the Best of Youth Movement in partnering with the Head Foundation to make this uh, session. And let's get into the conversation and hopefully that with my voice coming back a little bit more, we can also add to the voice of the children in our school system and how that we can make their education experience uh, something that is of worth to society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamda. I normally make a joke about his voice, but he's my boss. I'd now like to invite Mr. Sai Su Hong, the founder of The Best of You, for his opening message. Su Hong, please. Um, I think we're just going to listen to um, a little bit of a message from, <clears throat> yeah, a young, young kid by the name of Ron. Hi, my name is Ron. I really like making friends, but sometimes I feel like I'm not very good at it. My classmates sometimes treat me differently, but I'm just like any other 10-year-old boy who loves going to school and playing soccer with my friends. I'm actually busier than most of my friends because I have to run a lot of errands for my parents. I take care of my younger sister May and help out with the house chores too. We live in Jalan Kuko which some people say is a dangerous area. But our neighbours, Auntie Farida and Uncle Ming, are really nice to us. Recess is tough for me because most of the time, I don't have any pocket money to buy food. Sometimes, I just watch my friends play soccer and save my energy. But on lucky days, my friend Rajan will share his food with me if his mum packs any extra food for him. I feel really grateful when that happens. Most of the time, I'm thinking of what I can cook for lunch at home. I'm so hungry, I can't wait for school to be over. If you want to be my friend, you can visit the exhibition just outside to learn more about me. For my online friends, scan the QR code. I hope to see you soon. So um, that's the voice of our protagonist, Ron, in an online interactive storybook called The Impossible Timetable of Ron. The story walks through the day in the life of Ron, who comes from a low-income family. Um, in the story, he wakes up at 6 a.m. to help his sister get ready for school, while his parents are already out at work doing a few jobs to make ends meet. <clears throat> in the story, we also see his cramped living environment, his constant hunger, constant hunger and his time poverty. He juggles multiple adult responsibilities, including taking care of house chores and his sisters. And in addition to his homework, he also witnessed his sheep. We also witness his sheepish envy to join his friends for soccer, and the doubts he has for his own aspirations for the future. Ron's interactive story was developed during COVID as part of our school outreach program at the Best of You. The Best of You is an appreciative storytelling movement that champions multiple social causes. We believe that people's accounts of the best versions of themselves help us strengthen community bonds. This is the 10th year of our movement. Um, round of applause, everyone. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Apart from school outreach and featuring human stories, we also host this amazing series of talks called Conversations Reimagined, which we are here today to enjoy. Conversations Reimagined was born 
In 2019, I had this idea of a safe and conducive space where we could bring great people together and have a meaningful conversation about the important things that matter in our society. In this space, we can speak openly and bravely and break down and disrupt some of the most deeply problematic narratives that govern our lives. In this way, we can imagine a better future, a more inclusive one for our community as well. A strong democratic country requires healthy debate and discourse amongst its citizens about important issues. The word on the street, however, is that Singaporeans tend to be reticent about critical and heavy topics such as the one today. But over many editions of Conversations Reimagined, when it comes to building a better future for the country and beyond, many Singaporeans do not shy away from important and sometimes difficult conversations. Our first Conversations Reimagined asked us to reimagine a better future for our foreign migrant workers. Subsequent uh, events looked at food, food insecurity, poverty, and the working poor in Singapore, especially uncovering the new group of young precarious workers in the gig economy. Today's Conversations Reimagined, we continue on the topic of inequality through the lens of education this time. At the heart of today's conversation is about who we are as Singaporeans and our identity. We inhabit in a country touted to have one of the best education systems in the world. Now, inequality in the context of our discussion today refers to a few different but related things. First, unequal access to education facilities and opportunities in Singapore. Secondly, inequality perpetuated by divergent pathways in education in Singapore. And finally, perhaps the most important question today, if education is indeed the great leveler and proponent for upward mobility, and if Singapore's education is one of the best in the world, then by that logic, Singapore's wealth and income inequality must be one of the lowest in the world. We know that isn't the case. Two key words will come up frequently in our conversation today, and these are <clears throat> um, meritocracy, a strongly held principle in Singapore's nation building and development of social institutions and aspirations, including educational ones. You will experience upward mobility if you apply yourself diligently, work hard, get the right education, and produce merit, regardless of your income, backgrounds, gender, sexuality, and race. The other word is neoliberalism. Briefly, exp uh, briefly explained, neoliberalism is the idea that societies are best governed by a free market and free trade, where the state's role is to facilitate those conditions. Human well-being is then optimized if we we learn how to hone our individual entrepreneurial skills and freedoms. Under this framework, people who are successful are seen as taking sufficient responsibility for themselves and being enterprising. Those who are not socioeconomically successful have themselves to blame for not being enterprising enough, responsible enough, or hardworking enough. Do you see a similarity in the way that success is framed between meritocracy and neoliberalism? I'll let the speakers expound on them further in their discussions. During conversations we imagine, we get to meet wonderful organizations with similar goals of making Singapore a better place and society. Our last conversations we imagine was a collaboration with AMK FSC. And I'm very privileged to be partnering with the Head Foundation this time. We got to know about the Head Foundation through our keynote speaker, Charlene Chong. And this event could not be possible without the hard work of Changta and Vignesh and his team, and their team, as well as our esteemed speakers, Madam Molia, Stanley, Professor Alista, Aaron, and of course, Charlene. Collaborations such as these always make the conversation richer and more meaningful. So without further ado, I pass my time to Vignesh, our esteemed moderator for today's conversation, Reimagine, an unequal start. Please enjoy and engage deeply in our conversation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sihong. So ladies and gentlemen, now it's a true pleasure and privilege for us to invite today's keynote speaker, Dr. Charlene Cheung. Charlene is currently a senior researcher at the Australian Education Research Organization, and she's going to be talking about the findings from her book, Families, the State, 
and educational inequality in the Singapore city state. For those of you who are joining us in person, these books are available for sale outside. Hit Foundation gets no royalties from it, but I need to do some promotion. But ladies and gentlemen, I think it's a fantastic read if you have the opportunity. And this is a lot of the findings from Charlene's dissertation when she was doing her PhD at the University of Cambridge. So please join me in welcoming Charlene. Charlene, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for being here, um, for making the time to be here, both those who are here in person and also those who are joining us online today. Um, and thank you to the organizers, the best of you and the Head Foundation for the incredible work and energy that you've uh, both put into this event. Um, and also thank you for starting off the event with the story of Ron, which I think points to something uh, that is quite important, uh, which is that people live and come to education from a variety of circumstances, and it's important that we recognize that. So it's an honor to be here with all of you to share about a book that I wrote based on my PhD, uh, Families, the State and Educational Inequality in the Singapore City State. So the book is based on interviews that I conducted with uh, disadvantaged families and focuses on how these families um, experience Singapore's education system. So the thing about inequality and disadvantage is that it can be hard to see it and want to address it. We might hear about the poor, but for many of us, it can almost feel like it doesn't exist or that it might exist, but it's, it's very far away from us. Um, and that consciousness around disadvantage and inequality is rapidly changing, and I think in really good ways in Singapore. But seeing inequality remains a near universal challenge. And there are a wide range of reasons why, why that's the case. Well, one reason unique to Singapore is public housing. So by the late 1990s, more than 85% of Singapore's population lived in a public housing estate. And that's a remarkable number. Um, and I think it's great that such a large proportion of the population has a roof overhead. Um, but sociologists have also written about how this also invisibilizes poverty in a way. Um, and it gives the appearance of similarity in circumstances. But a family of nine, for instance, may live in a one bedroom flat in very difficult circumstances, like one of the families that I interviewed. So for this project, I sought to understand the views of disadvantaged families. I spent eight months living in a public housing flat in Singapore, not far from where some of these families lived. Um, I interviewed families often in their homes, but sometimes in a neighborhood McDonald's. Um, I would sometimes spend whole afternoons with them, share meals with them and so on. And there are different aspects of the book that I could talk about today, but I think the one that I want to talk about um, that I hope to get across is one that I think cuts across every implication, every theme and theoretical and methodological choice in this book. And that is that families' perspectives and experiences matter. They can be deeply helpful in helping us understand the system um, and how they interact with the system. And also their perspectives can push us to reframe the way we think about the problems we try to solve. And as critical policy scholars uh, suggest, how we frame and represent problems is crucial because different representations can advantage and disadvantage certain groups, and it can affect how we address these problems and whether we address them fairly. So that's the key point. So before I dive into families' perspectives and experiences, I'd like to just start with context. So as I go through these points, have a think about how such a context might shape families' educational experiences. So when the word Singapore comes to mind, people often think of a small post-colonial multiracial city-state with a majority of ethnic Chinese um, and Indian and Malay minority groups. It's portrayed in media as a global city, very clean, um, and with a top performing education system according to international education benchmarking tests. In terms of social political context, um, a few noteworthy aspects. So scholars have described Singapore as a strong developmental state, uh, which basically means that the state plays a large role across different affairs related to the nation's development, uh, for example, and I think especially education. So the majority of schools are under the oversight and the financing of Singapore's Ministry of Education. Um, historically, Singaporean politicians have been particularly interested in education. They've emphasized that as a small state with few natural resources, developing human capital is absolutely crucial to Singapore's survival. 
And generally, Singapore's approach to intervention is opposite to many high spending European welfare states, but education seems to be an exception to the rule. So almost all schools in Singapore are heavily subsidized, they're virtually free, and of reasonably high quality as well. So while this seems to invite dependence, as, uh, yeah, dependence on the state in some ways, there are at the same time these self-responsibilizing neoliberal logics that structure Singapore's education system. So by neoliberal, as Su Hong also mentioned, um, it refers to a way of thinking that sees education's main goal as economic benefits and getting a job. And it's often related to policies that emphasize efficiency, competition, self-reliance. And some scholars suggest that the clearest evidence of these self-responsibilizing logics is the foundational pillar, the ideological heart of Singaporean public and education policy, the concept of meritocracy. So Singaporean meritocracy goes something like this, that it suggests that any individual, regardless of background, with talent and hard work can achieve education and life success. And that emphasis on individual effort and performance is reinforced through high levels of streaming um, and rigorous high stakes examinations. But when examined closely, Singaporean meritocracy embodies both neoliberal and strong state logics because it seems to work as follows. In light of high quality state provision, i.e. The, the dependability of the state, individuals and families can and should bear responsibility for education and life success. And the metaphor of leveling the playing field is a pervasive one in Singapore, right? Uh, that is the state will provide high quality, virtually free schooling. But beyond this, and indeed because of this, you and your family need to be responsible and help yourselves. But in recent years, there's been growing discontent in Singapore over the unfairness of meritocracy. Um, and there's research that, su that suggests persistent and widening education inequalities in Singapore. For example, there's quantitative data um, that suggests gaps in education attainment between those from different uh, class backgrounds. There's growing recognition that meritocracy, as, um, as Aaron Koh, who will be speaking later, put it well, it favors those who already have the capital. And you see that kind of illustrated in this comic in a Singapore online forum here. So here you can see uh, these upper middle class families who are um, extensively strategizing. They're doing everything in their power to ensure the very best outcomes for their children. Private tuition, enrichment classes, domestic help. Um, and that's in stark contrast to the circumstances of a less advantaged family. So in light of this complex social political context of Singapore, that is a strong state that invites dependence in some ways, yet also promotes neoliberal self-responsibilizing logics, and the existence of inequality in Singapore. Uh, my work seeks to address two questions. So first, how do disadvantaged families navigate Singapore's education system? Um, and second, how do they relate to the state and state institutions as they do so? So I wanted to explore these questions given there's a little research that engages the perspectives of groups on the sharp end of inequality to hear on their terms, their representations uh, of their experiences, anxieties, and aspirations. So in December 2016, I approached local community organizations in Singapore for help in contacting families. And after securing their approval, I sent them my criteria for disadvantaged families. So there's no official social class mapping in Singapore. So I defined disadvantage drawing on academic literature and also um, the Singapore Department of Statistics data. Uh, so I, this criteria is based on household income, parental education and parental occupation. And I focused only on students who were 16 to 17 years old um, and their parents or primary caregivers. In some cases, that was their grandparents. Um, but occasionally, their siblings would also join in because they would be um, inside the house and they would hear the interviews happening and they would put their hands up to be part of the interview as well. Um, and I also only interviewed ethnic minority families, so those who self-identified as Indian or Malay. Um, and I conducted three rounds of interview with each family, so two semi-structured and then one focus group interview. And in total, I conducted 72 interviews with 12 families. What I found perhaps most striking from the interviews that I conducted was that there's much research literature, especially UK, US, um, the Aust uh, Australia-based literature as well, um, that portrays relationships between disadvantaged families and the schools as really fraught and uneasy, uh, where families experience these feelings of alienation, distance, um, and distrust um, towards schools. 
But in Singapore, however, homeschool relations generally seem to be warm, close and friendly. So families deeply appreciated the schools and the state by proxy because schools were seen as a benefaction of the strong state. Um, in the introduction of my book, I describe these close relations with the school and state through the story of Anjushri's family. So I'll read an excerpt from it now. When Sanjay got caught smoking in school, his mother Anjushri slapped him. The whole term, Sanjay's grades had been free falling and Anjushri's anxiety was at breaking point. Anjushri cried to him, enough already Sanjay, since so many years you're very well in school. This year you're going to finish secondary four. What happened to you? Why are you, why are you putting yourself into trouble? She knew she would cry if she went to see the principal with Sanjay, so her husband, Srinivas, went instead. From that meeting, Srinivas and Anjushri realized that Anjushri's daughter from her first marriage, Myra, had been teaching Sanjay to smoke. And Sanjay had been hanging out with friends who weren't interested in studying and, and so on. And Srinivas, who had been part of a gang in his late teens and early 20s himself, spoke to his son sternly. I can only tell one thing, your mother trusting you a lot. Don't do that. What are you doing to her that God is looking at you? You will get the punishment, not your mother. She already has lots of suffer already. Why are you all giving us sufferings? His teachers helped Srinivas and Anjushri in choosing an appropriate form of discipline for Sanjay. Anjushri recalled with a laugh, Sunday Sanjay will play soccer with the church people, now canceled already. My husband said, don't go, punishment for you, few months you don't go. According to Anjushri, his teachers had called them, telling them, give him this punishment, don't let him go, and don't give him handphone a lot. There was a long list of people and systems out there that could not be trusted, and Jushri felt, particularly for, quote, low-income, uneducated families like herself. Take, for instance, her own mother, who tried to cheat her out of her father's inheritance money when he died. However, the Singapore government's management of its education system was an anomaly in a dark sea of broken systems and people, and she and Srinivas gladly collaborated with teachers in overseeing and raising their children. Srinivas stated, I respect the Singapore government, the father of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. He was here. He already do for us everything already. Everything already he do. Then he say bye bye. And then he go. For Singapore government, for Singaporean, they never gave us suffer. What you need, everything here. However, not only did families appreciate the state and schools, parents and children accepted responsibility for success. And in particular, they devolved this responsibility to young people. Young people were seen as ultimately responsible for success. So to understand why this was the case, this positivity, this willingness to accept responsibility, I drew up from the data a plausibility structure, so reasons that made plausible the acceptance of responsibility. So two aspects of this plausibility structure that I will uh, go on to explain. First, the perceived competence and the perceived care of the state and school, um, which I'll explain in turn. So materially, families felt that the state had provided schools and tuition programs that are of high quality and well-funded. Families felt their beliefs in the competence of the state and schools were validated by what they saw in the news about Singapore's rankings as number one in the world in science, maths, and so on. And you can see this in this quote from one mother. And this is an unsurprising finding. Um, Varki Foundation survey results suggest that 73% of Singaporean families felt government-funded schools were good. And that's significantly higher than the global average of 45%. In contrast to this, perceived, uh, to this perceived competence, disadvantaged families see themselves as uneducated and less capable at child rearing, and thus felt grateful for the work of the state and schools. The second aspect of this plausibility structure is the notion of the care of the state and school. So teachers in Singapore were seen as very caring, as doing all in their power to help children to navigate a tough education system. As such, there was a level of trust and a relatively free flow of information between the home and the school. So children would consult teachers on their education and even their personal life decisions. And parents would also consult teachers on how to help their children to develop academically and emotionally. And teachers and school counselors were people that young people often trusted to talk to about their personal matters when they felt they had nowhere to turn. These relationships were, uh, they often uh, formed in this important buffer, especially for disadvantaged families, given research studies such as uh, a recent Singapore Children's Society study that suggests low income young people experience disproportionately high rates of negative childhood experience, for example, being bullied, having a family member in prison or with mental illness. 
So while both parents and young people, they talked about the care of the, of the teachers, young people in particular, they used the imagery of friendship, even family, to discuss their relationship with teachers. So you can see that in this quote by one young person, Deepta. She was one of the young people who sought counsel from her teacher when their family went through a brief season of domestic abuse. Um, so she said, you'll feel that teachers are legit our parents. They don't judge actually. They actually focus more on the positive side. The chain of reasoning families describe seem to be as follows. Families depend on the state's competence and on the care of teachers, and this dependence enables or makes plausible for families the acceptance and devolution of responsibility to the child. And dependency as a term is often seen as antithetical or opposite to responsibility. So it's often assumed you can't be both at the same time, right? You can't be both dependent and responsible at the same time. But, but my findings suggest that they work synergistically together for families. In fact, the context of dependency makes plausible responsibility. And this might be interpreted as the internalization and reproduction of the key logics of Singaporean meritocracy, i.e. the state has provided sufficient dependency context, therefore you should take responsibility. So we see this chain of reasoning in red here uh, in this quote by one father, Srinivas. Uh, when asked what he liked about Singapore's education system, he said, Singapore education-wise, what I like, first thing uh, for education-wise, we go to our Singapore government, our MPs, first place they will help you. They never say no, no such thing. For education, you go to our Singapore government, they will ask you what? If it's regarding education, come, 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 sit down, what do you want? Other thing, the MP will say, okay, I will write a letter, wait for the reply to come. But education-wise, no such thing. No money, you don't have uniform to buy for your children, no pocket money, no shoe, no problem. They write a letter, this letter you go give to your school and you can collect these from the school. So if the children don't wanna to listen to us, you know everything, but you don't wanna have a good life, that is up to you. You cannot blame the school, you cannot blame the parents. Everything they already give you, a decision is yours, your life. You want to do, that is up to you. And families critique the government in, in various other ways. They felt that they didn't give enough for large families. Um, and there's so much bureaucracy in applying for welfare payments, some of these families uh, said, uh, but they were grateful for the way the Singapore government managed its education. Um, and in light of this, they felt that young people were the most responsible for success. However, while families broadly accepted this chain of reasoning, sometimes these relations of responsibility and dependency, they were experienced very differently by families depending on their circumstances. And I'll provide a few examples of this now. This point became particularly clear to me when I visited IU's family. So they were probably the most disadvantaged family that I interviewed. So they faced multiple intersecting disadvantages. Um, she was fighting cancer. They had seven children to financially support. They were living in a one bedroom rental flat um, and her husband had to drop out of work to care for the children. Um, they, were, uh, they were living on nearly zero dollars a month and almost completely on welfare. So I quote from a fieldwork note I wrote after visiting their home. The house itself is a one bedroom, so not a lot of space for a family of nine. The living room has a small empty space for the kids to play. There is no couch. The only seating available is two chairs at a table pushed against the wall. The living room connects to a tiny kitchen and there's a small sink just outside the toilet. Um, it's filled with paraphernalia. The whole family sleeps inside the one bedroom. And taking up educational responsibility became impossible for Kawi, IU's eldest son, who dropped out of ITE, so the Institute of Technical Education, um, which is a post-secondary education institute in Singapore. Um, he dropped out of work to work as a cleaner and restaurant worker to financially support the family. So I quote again from the book. Like all families in this study, IU strongly believed in the value of education. She told her children, if you think you can go further studies, you try your best, you go ahead. Don't think of mommy all that. No need to think about that. Yet this was what Kawi, her 19 year old son decided to do when he dropped out of ITE to work part-time as a restaurant worker and cleaner to support their family. Initially, Ayu and Radzi tried to persuade their son against dropping out, but relented when they heard his reasoning. So I quote Ayu, his mother. Then we talked to him, he talked to us also, he tell us everything. And my husband said, we cannot force him to school if he don't want. That is what he want for his brothers and sisters. Kawi say, never mind, I won't lose anything. I can study next time. Now also I work. 
he worked KFC for two years, okay? He started working when he was in secondary three. He doing part-time. So it's unsurprising that their family was less warm and less trusting in their relations with the school and state. And what became clear to me was that if families don't find the state and school to be dependable, if the dependency context is not sufficiently robust, it can adversely affect families' willingness and their capacity to take up educational responsibility and ownership for their lives. Another example relates to young people's aspirations. So in this study, young people were 16 or 17, so they were on the cusp of deciding which post-secondary institution they wanted to attend. So in Singapore, as a, as a Singapore audience will know, there are three key publicly provided post-secondary institutions. Um, there's junior college, which, is the, which has the most academically, academically competitive admissions. Uh, and typically prepares a person for a uni, um, and two vocational education institutions, uh, polytechnics and institutes of technical education. And at least for now, JC uh, and uni provides the most straightforward route to financial and cultural rewards, uh, though there have been significant measures by the government over the years to improve and professional, professionalize pathways post-poly and ITE education. So on surface, families had high aspirations. They described the potential of education as immensely positive and transformative for their life chances and future success. So they really, really believed in education. But when asked to describe post-secondary plans more concretely, not one young person wanted to apply to junior college. And that's not really a problem, except the reason was because they wanted to avoid the risk that they would struggle to keep up with the rigor and pace and drop out altogether. And these were young people who were achieving well at school. They were academically inclined, uh, who were in the top academic stream, but they too would refuse to apply to junior college, which sometimes resulted in parent-child conflict. Um, so um, some quotes from my book here. Uh, yeah, hey, I tell Sanjay, go to JC. JC is very good. Uh, but Sanjay said, don't want, once I fail, I finished. I go poly better. Um, and Devi, who said, um, I don't want JC, JC is too stressful. I want to go to the middle, the safe route. And it struck me that wealthier families might seek additional support for their children uh, if they struggled in JC through private tuition. They can afford failure, so to speak, by absorbing the costs of money and time of an aborted JC education. They can find alternatives, they can send their children overseas, but this isn't a privilege that disadvantaged families have. So it's clear here too that the perceived thinness of the safety net um, and the risk of failure can restrict young people's capacity to take up responsibility, making the, ex the expectations that people have of academically inclined disadvantaged young people sometimes quite implausible. And taking up responsibility sometimes felt implausible too for disadvantaged young people who found responsibility claustrophobic. So in interviews, disadvantaged families felt responsibility was mainly about getting academic grades, especially English and math grades. And sometimes people think that disadvantaged families don't care enough about grades, but my findings suggest that it's actually the opposite, that families saw education as critical to a better life, to taking away the shame of having a low income. So they were in a way desperate for education. But young people, they sometimes felt disillusionment, this sense of being trapped within a singular reality of the all important academic grade. And as one young person, Irfan put it, my friends and I talk about life, how bad it is. Like in life, the main thing we see is just to get money and education. That's what we see. And then if you don't get education and money, then people will think that we're useless. This suggests to me that particularly for young people who are less academically inclined, the focus on academic grades might cost us their engagement with education, their willingness to take up responsibility, if responsibility feels so narrowly defined. Overall, these relations of trust, dependency, and responsibility, they differ in how they play out in the Singapore context compared to research conducted in many other contexts. And I think that's partly because of the role that the state and the schools um, um, and their partners play in developing relations of trust, even friendship with families. And I think there are several commendable aspects of the management of education in Singapore that do facilitate genuine trust and partnership. At the same time, I also think there's a need for us to consider the nature and the effects of these relations of responsibility and dependency. Do these relations empower, motivate, create opportunities for progress and partnership? 
or does it exact too heavy and oppressive a burden on families? And under what circumstances might these relations have different effects? So while the responsible self and the responsible family is a dominant recurring concept in many developed competitive economies, while it's emphasized or implied as a desired endpoint in public policy in many such states, my research suggests that we need to pay more careful attention to concepts such as the plausibility of responsibility and the importance of dependency as a context for responsibility. And this seems particularly important in our hyper-competitive and individualistic age. Now, I recognize that responsibility and dependency are terms that attract a lot of negative press and critique. Um, but my work points to ways that we might challenge um, current perceptions of these terms and understand them in richer and, and fairer ways. So by dependency, um, I don't mean passive reliance, um, as it's sometimes understood, but as an unavoidable part or fact of being human, because we all depend in our old age, in our childhood, um, in tough seasons of our lives. And as my research suggests, it's a precondition for feeling safe and supported to take up responsibility. And by responsibility, I don't mean forcing individuals to bear the burden of their poverty, um, I see responsibility as dispositions and actions that are actually crucial to the healthy functioning of societies. But might we understand responsibility in a broader, more relational way as not just about individual advancement and grades, but also responsibility for others to develop and to develop the different gifts that we have. So ultimately, I hope that my work illustrates not only the necessary interconnectedness, that synergy between responsibility and dependency, but additionally also challenges the way that we understand these two concepts in the first place, these two concepts of responsibility and dependency that are uh, often so pervasive in the way or implied in the way that we think and talk about the problem of disadvantage and inequality. So what might all this mean for how we re reframe the issue? So speaking to families has led me to advocate for a shift in how we frame the issue concerning disadvantaged families, which is important because the way we frame the issue can trickle down and it can impact um, the way we speak, our actions, interactions, and the way we design policies and services. So the dominant issue concerning disadvantaged families is often, how do we make families responsible? And that can lead to approaches that focus on competition and individual and family self-reliance. But one might reframe the issue to how do we make responsibility plausible for families? And that entails the need to continue developing a strong professional school workforce that are perceived as technically competent and caring by families. It entails understanding and taking seriously the complex interconnected barriers that disadvantaged families um, experience, uh, financial, health, emotional factors, which are often really intertwined um, in their lives. And having accounted for these barriers, making support for disadvantaged families more nuanced, contextualized, and sufficient to make reasonable the uptake of responsibility. Finally, it might also entail developing a vision of responsibility that young people, not just the academically inclined, um, can resonate with. In summary, my book highlights the value of three things. First, the value of families' perspectives in helping us understand the system. And from this, the value of schools and teachers and the well being of disadvantaged families. And third, the value of dependency in making responsibility plausible and the necessary interconnectedness as part of the human condition. So to conclude a story. So after I finished an interview, I decided to call a grab back because it was late at night and I was running late to a dinner appointment. And the grab driver was, as it turned out, a teacher who had taught in a low income secondary school for many years. So he started sharing his experiences about how Singapore appeared a cosmopolitan and brilliant city with much to be proud of, um, which I do agree with. Um, but that there was also imperfection behind the closed door of families' homes. And at this point, we passed some government housing flats and he pointed at them and he said, uh, and I paraphrase slightly, behind every closed door, there's a story, whether a happy one or one of heartbreak. We don't really know Singapore until we venture into the world of the disadvantaged and try to understand their challenges too. And I think that's a way of summing up what I hope my research will do to as sensitively as I can, with permission, try to get behind the closed door of homes to understand their stories and opinions, which can help us in understanding, challenging, rethinking, and reimagining the problem in ways that are fairer for those who might find it hard to be heard. Thank you all very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Charlene, for a very enlightening sharing of the research that you conducted. I think truly what we're trying to, to do today is also take a peek. I cannot speak for those of you joining us online or the rest of you in the room. But for me, many of the narratives that Charlene shared are new, are not my lived experience, but a lived experience of my fellow Singaporeans, a lived experience of neighbours and of friends. So peeking through that closed door gives us the opportunity to understand better and gives us the opportunity to suggest and reimagine what the future could look like. I think since Charlene has shared her findings from the book, it's time for us to discuss that. And we're really honoured today to have an interdisciplinary scholar in sociology of education, global studies in education, and international and comparative education. Associate Professor Aaron Ko is from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and has very kindly agreed to join us today as a discussion to share his perspectives on Charlene's books and also his thoughts on education in Singapore in general. So we'd now like to invite Aaron to join us. Aaron, please. First of all, let me thank um, Hey Foundation, the best of me and Charlene for inviting me to be the, the discussant for this book. Um, this is by far one of the best books that I've ever read on Singapore education. And I told Charlene privately just now that it, it surely deserves some kind of book award. And I encourage her to submit her book manuscript to uh, one of the comparative um, uh, SIG group, um, Sociology of Education, Special Interest Group. Um, it's the first book that explores, and I quote um, um, Charlene's book, the role of state in mediating the relationship between families and inequalities, and that's taken from page 32. Um, and my role here is to share with you some of my thoughts um, on the book, because I have the privilege of um, reading from cover to cover the last, um, the last week when I was uh, back in, um, from Hong Kong. Now, um, I'll run through some of my thoughts and, and, and I'll also ask uh, a few questions, raise a few questions that uh, for Charlene to think about. Let me start with my first point. And what strikes me as most interesting is the book is organized around time, that notion of morning, noon, and night. It actually reminds me of an overture that I played before when I was in the symphonic band, morning, noon, and night overture in, uh, in Vienna. You know. So, so this, this, this like strikes me immediately. And I thought uh, the structure really reminds me of Bob Lingard and Greg Thompson's doing time in sociology of education, where they argue that time is lived and, and, and this lived time flows in multiple directions, such as the past and future are always available in the present. In the, work, in the book, we see the lived experiences of the um, low income families, how they navigate the difficult life trajectories and education systems through education policies. Now, the passing of uh, time as a nation then, now, is also reflected in the book, in particular, the theme on meritocracy, which uh, I believe the dis distinguished panel of speakers will have a lot to say about these. And I'm going to uh, briefly comment about this in a short while as well. So um, <clears throat> how social policies and educations change over time have um, effect on individuals uh, and their lives. And this is actually reflected uh, in the book as well. I was going to read bits of it, but I thought in the interest of time, I'll skip it. And my next point, moving on, is the theme of responsabilization. It's quite a mouthful trying to uh, explain it, uh, speak, uh, pronounce this four syllable uh, word. I think this, this word itself begs two question. Who is responsible for who? And responsible for what? And, I, and we know, as uh, Zhu Hong mentioned earlier on, this, this word responsabilization is closely related to uh, the, the concept of neoliberalism, where the free economy, free market economy reigns and the state takes a, and the state uh, takes a back seat. And that's where competition and strife comes in. And that's where uh, 
uh, people are supposed, supposed to be responsible for themselves, so much so that they are all caught up in this enterprising or this enterprisation of self-making, you know. You need to make yourself com more competitive. And we see this, how, how this cascade down into our education system, right? Whether you're from low, uh, low income families or you're from upper middle class, there's so much competition going on in the education system. How do you navigate around this kind of uh, self enterprising projects and the competition that uh, our students are caught in? Um, and this is where uh, Charlene mentioned uh, she started introducing the theme of dependency and self responsabilization logics. And I want to read a quote which uh, she she wrote it very well, and she mentioned it just now. And that's taken from page 51. Just give me a minute. On page 51, uh, and I quote um, Charlene, development state logics seems to encourage a level of dependency on the state. Yet there exist alongside market logics that valorize the rationality and responsibility of the individual and the individual family. Now, here's my response. Now, these dependency logics, I argue, can work in two contradictory ways. First, it can lead to a level of self-entitlement in when the disadvantage does not receive the help that they need. They can become disgruntled. They will say, uh, you know, why nobody is helping me? I'm, I'm so poor, I need help, all right? But uh, in those days when, you know, uh, I have to disclose, and I don't mind disclosing this, I come from a disadvantaged family myself, right? A family of 10, Chinese family, not enough food on the table, but uh, how did we, well, how did, I, how did my family navigate all of this? Sure hard work, right? I mean, we don't reach out to people, uh, we don't, the government doesn't help us in those days. All right. So, um, and the the second, secondly, the government can actually kind of benefit from the legitimacy of getting the, the reputation of uh, oh, you know, uh, we care, we care for the disadvantage. So we provide, we try to reach out, we try to give as much as possible. And we have seen this, uh, seen the gov what the government is doing. I mean, they've been uh, in the last budget debate. Um, the 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 uh, the government has actually extensive uh, extended massive help to lower income families, all right. So I think um, when the government do does that, it, it earns for it earns for itself the reputation of being a good and caring government, and that you know they are aware and they are in control um, of um, uh, disadvantage in in Singapore. My next point has to do with uh, neoliberal families and parenting, which is also another theme that uh, comes across uh, in the book. But we tend to use this term in relation, in, uh, especially in the sociology of literature, education literature, that uh, it's, it, it's, it's the upper and the middle and upper class families, uh, the so-called helicopter families parent, or parents who micromanage the lives of their kids from sending them to extracurricular activities to tuition centers. But this term, this term transcends in the book, transcends race and class. As Charlene's studies, study has actually found out that working class families or low income families, uh, they have actually internalized, and I quote, internalized and accepted many neoliberal imperatives, right? They have also become neoliberal parents themselves, despite the fact that they are disadvantaged families. Uh, she, go, she goes on to elucidate, elucidate uh, using three types of pedagog pedagogic approaches families adopt. And one of these is disciplinary, uh, help seeking, and thirdly, protective approaches. Now, this is very different from upper middle class. Right, because they have the capital and resources and social capital to prepare their children for the future, to invest in their children, right? Uh, and linking this to uh, my next point is, what would Bojo say, uh, you know, if he's still alive, 
<laughs> or, or if, if, uh, how do we apply Bourdieu's theory? Um, Charlene kind of disagree with, uh, uh, in her book on page 30, 33, she says that um, a book, um, a Bourdieu doesn't seem to apply to fit well, but I would argue to the contrary. It, it actually explains very well why some families, some disadvantaged families don't make it and that cycle of reproduction of inequality get reproduced uh, across generation. Now, um, Charlene, you might disagree with me, but it, um, Bourdieu's work is not about, it's not all about capital accumulation, you know, but I think the important point that we can bring to the discussion is uh, families do need to have capital, sufficient capital, not just money, but the connection, but setting up the right environment for students to study, for their kids to study so that they can study in peace, you know, even though they may not have much. But uh, what we know from the documentaries that we see, many of these families, especially disadvantaged families, do not have proper environment to study in the first, uh, in, in, in the first place. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a need and Bordeaux's theory works very well for us to think through uh, how education inequalities get reproduced because in the first place, families do not have the family capital. Now, the next point that and also a question that I want to ask Charlene is, where are the Chinese working class families in the study? All right, I mean, uh, by omitting Chinese working family class, I think um, inevitably we, we kind of reinforce the stereotypes of poor people are only the Malays and the Indians, you know, but there are poor Chinese families, you know, this is just an aside. Um, I live in Hong Kong and I watch a lot of uh, uh, TV documentaries on Me Watch. And one of these favorite programs that I followed uh, throughout the three seasons is a program called Reno, Reno 8. And this is such a meaningful program because uh, the sponsors, uh, well, I believe they have their shortlisting criteria, but they feature and they reach out to disadvantaged families across class, across race, uh, even the elderly who need their home to be renovated, brand new, so that they can, can live comfortably because on their own, they, they wouldn't be able to afford to renovate their, their small three bedroom, often it's three bedroom apartment, which are very, very run down. So my point is, um, it is not just um, working class or low income families that uh, are from Malay, from Indian families who need help, but there are Chinese working class families who need to be reached out as well. My final point, and I'll conclude on this note, is the idea of meritocracy, which, I mean, it's an important theme in the book, and Charlene has touched on that as well. And for me, uh, we, we need to be asking this question, meritocracy for who? Now, in, the, in Charlene's book, she gave us a quick snapshot history of uh, meritocracy on page 18. Now, it works in the past, right? To, as an instrument or as a mechanism to manage race and inequality and equality. But now meritocracy is under scrutiny and has become a contentious term. Why? Because inequality has, come, has become more visible and competition uh, generated by the neo, neoliberal economy is keenly felt in the education system. Who, we just need to ask who and what racial groups are making into elite schools, by the way, uh, I, I am one of those researchers who studies, study elite schools. I believe in studying up, if you want to find out the whole picture of inequality, why you know, uh, there's inequality in, in, in Singapore or elsewhere, you need to study up as well. You need to find out why people who are rich, they are able to maintain their power and privilege and continue to reproduce their power and privilege. Um, now, I think, uh, uh, back to my point about meritocracy, and we need, as I, as I mentioned just now, who and what racial groups are making to elite schools and our two comprehensive universities. Now, my point is, the level of playing field, and we have, we have heard this over and over again, is not equal at the starting line, as because 
Some families clearly have more resources and connections than others, all right? But that is not to say that the government is not aware of these and is not doing anything. Uh, I think, uh, thanks to Alistair for sh uh, sharing with us, sharing with the group about the article that came out in the Straits Time uh, on Wednesday about how there are positive steps that are moving in the right direction. And I think with that, I close and uh, get Charlene to respond to my few questions and observations. Over to Charlene. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, that was really great and um, so good to have these insights um, from someone with uh, your kind of scholarly background and also your personal background as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that with me. Um, maybe I'll, so I've been taking notes as you were speaking, maybe I'll try to um, speak through and if, if I'm not kind of answering your question, just jump in and yeah. we can make yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so with the time, with the, with the kind of like structure of time of morning, noon and night, um, uh, thank you for appreciating that. I think the I think that structure was actually it came out of a um, a an activity that I asked disadvantaged families to do at the end of the interview. So tell me about what your morning, what your afternoon, what your night looks like. So both a week weekday and a weekend kind of um, feel. So I could kind of see what their days look like, um, and it's really a device to highlight the importance of the everydayness um, of their lives and helping us to understand. Um, uh, in terms of helping us in our thinking about disadvantage and, and inequality. Um, so I think the book tries to help us to kind of move through the day of a, um, of a disadvantaged family as well. Um, maybe here I'll, I'll jump to your question on, uh, on Bourdieu. Uh, so Bourdieu, of course, um, a very eminent sociologist who has written a lot about the relationship between families uh, educa and educational inequality. Um, and he and he's very, I think, insightful in terms of helping us unpack the mechanisms through which inequality exerts itself. Um, so, for example, through different differing levels of economic capital, social cap capital, cultural capital, um, and so on. Um, the reasons why I uh, why I didn't choose a Bourdieu framework, although a lot of scholars uh, use that and use it very well, um, is I think when I got into the field. And when I started to speak to families, um, I realized something, which is that inequality is very complicated. So Bourdieu's starting point is that there are differences in capital between um, disadvantaged and advantaged family. But I wanted to say, I don't know. I actually don't know like what's the, like, what, like how inequality works in Singapore, because there, there are these kind of like large scale statistics that suggest that, um, yes, there's disadvantage, there's inequality in Singapore. So I was coming into the field with my kind of research um, understanding that you know, the researchers are pointing towards some level of inequality in Singapore's education system. But then when I was in the field, when I was kind of speaking to families, what I also realized is that they had very kind of positive constructions of their life success, of, of, of like the possibility of education giving them life success. And I wanted a theoretical framework that didn't kind of start with education is perpetuating inequality, education is not perpetuating inequality, but have a more kind of open ended, like, tool uh, where I can say, I don't know, and I want to learn. Um, and so I actually like that the book is kind of, you can, one way of seeing the book is a, a wrestling of this tension between what the research says, what the, the critical quantitative research suggests about inequality in Singapore and what disadvantaged families are saying, because I think it's also really important to respect their perspectives um, and to take it seriously when they say that they do believe that education, um, education can help them to, to move forward. Um, so it was partly that, that, that wanting to be open-ended about that, um, that I chose the three tiers of governance framework, which yeah, doesn't kind of start which with is, a... Uh, which is brilliant, actually. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, yeah, and so with regards to the Chinese families, yeah, that's, uh, yeah I, I do take your point that, yeah, it's imp important that we don't uh, perpetuate st stereotypes um, of disadvantaged families. And... The reasons why I chose disadvantaged uh, ethnic, so the reasons why I spoke to ethnic minority families was um, I wanted to understand the lives of groups that are, according to the research, underrepresented in elite institutions um, and uh, relatively speaking underperforming uh, compared to um, the, uh, the other groups. Um, and then the, the kind of other reason was just a decision to kind of limit the scope of my work because I, I guess it's just a practical kind of um, consideration that I couldn't include um, 
uh, Chinese families as well, given the time and yeah. practical constraints. But I do agree that that would be a good um, oh, addition to the it, work. It could be uh, going forward. Uh, yeah, going forward, future future work. Yeah. That you could do. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And um, yeah, maybe the last point that I will mention is that in, I do agree that inequality is relational. So it's important to to also kind of see what's happening. Um, at the top and kind of what's happening. Uh, so my book kind of focuses on what disadvantaged families are thinking and experiencing. That would be another um, good addition to the yeah. work to understand yeah. that what the, um, well, I was kind of thinking also that there is some research out there on the Singaporean middle class and what they are doing to and uh, for their children um, and less so on disadvantaged groups. So that was also a, that also weighed into my decision there. Yeah, but thank you so much for your comments and your kind, um, yeah, your kind comments about this work. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me once again in thanking both Aaron and Charlene for sharing their perspectives on the book. I think now we move to the next part of today's session, which is our panel discussion. We have heard from the academic perspective, from the research and empirical data about what's happening with education in Singapore. What is perpetuating some of these inequalities? What can we do to, to overcome them? How can we as a society move forward in a manner that's healthy, that's equitable and beneficial for all? I think the term was moving forward is also very meaningful. And I think Aaron alluded to an article that one of our panelists, Alistair, shared with us uh, via email over the week. And it talks about the move of ACS, ACS primary moving to Tonga. What does that mean? I know some of us in this room may come from ACS. So what does that mean for you as an alumni of the school? But how does that address some of these issues of inequality that we face? So to help answer some of these questions, share their perspectives. I think they have a combined experience of more than a century working on education and social sectors in Singapore. That's not to allude anything to their age, but we have many of them on the panel. But I think they have done so much for Singapore, these individuals, but they have lived and experienced and seen so much too. So it's a real pleasure and an honor to invite our panelists to join me on stage as we continue to discuss this issue, as we try to understand it better, education and equal start. Our panelists, please. So for those of you who are joining us online, I see a number of questions being asked because we have this broadcast both on Facebook and on Zoom. So do ask your questions in the chat platforms where you are watching us from. My colleagues will be feeding these questions to us on, uh, on our tablet, so I'll be happy to ask these questions on your behalf. As we start this panel session, I'm going to invite each of our distinguished panelists to make a short address to share some of their perspectives, some of their lived experience. And that will give us an opportunity to ponder a bit more deeply and think about the questions that we would like to ask them. So our very first panelist is Madam Molia Hashim. Madam Molia was a direct, is currently a director of SMRT Trains Limited and Strides PSD Private Limited. But importantly, she has a 40-year career in the education sector in Singapore as an educator, a school leader, a school superintendent. And for four years, she served as a CEO of Yayasan Mendaki. So Madam Molia, would you like to make your address? Thank you. Um, it's not an address, it's a three, four minutes. Three, four minutes, please. <laughs> comment. Thank you very much, uh, Vignesh. And of course, thank you very much to Head Foundation and the best of you uh, to have me uh, on this panel. And um, I cringe every time Vignesh is honorable, distinguished, eminent uh, panel speakers. Uh, we, we will do our best. Um, I want to first say that Dr. Chong's book is a must read for all educators in Singapore. I'm not getting any royalties, but it is a must read. <laughs> and um, only for, um, or, or even for the fact that uh, her recent studies, her in-depth uh, interviews with the 12 families, the privilege of, of uh, being with them over a period of eight months, um, digging deeper into their lives, sharing meals with them. That is something which we in schools would love to do, honestly. So if there was any value, at least the value is that Dr. Chung's book is an update 
a reminder right of the complexities of the realities of these families to us and it would be a very good read also for educators to understand the sociological uh, framework as well as the concepts of what is it Aaron responsabilization and dependence and um, of course we have our own understanding and our own vocabulary in school to refer to the same thing uh, um, but it will offer us um, an opportunity to dig deeper into understanding that from the sociological perspective. Um, I also thought that Dr. Chong's book um, affirms a lot um, the good work that a school is doing, not because I'm just recently from schools, but uh, we all uh, cannot argue, right, there's not for the lack of efforts, not for the lack of investment, right, in education, and his her research has shown that. Um, and the fact that uh, parents have got a lot of confidence, hopes, uh, as well as belief in the fact that what's happening in school will make a, a, a change in, in their children's lives. So I thought it is really, honestly, um, a good read uh, for educators and people who work with disadvantaged families. So my brief comment, uh, Vignesh, is in and around, uh, therefore, ways that schools can engage these disadvantaged families. Um, before I do that, um, having come from the system recently and uh, having, you know, uh, all agreed uh, the accolades that we receive around the world in terms of our, our global standing, uh, I felt the need to um, bring up this particular quote from Coetel 2014, I think, that I found in uh, Charlene's book. And it says this, Trying to criticize the Singapore education system can feel like shouting into a vacuum or chasing wind. Criticisms that are easily left behind the neutrality of the smokescreen of meritocratic talk. So when I was reading this and I was thinking about what it means or what it should mean to us within the education system, right? Um, there is really a uh, little room if you want to poke at the education system that we have not done, right? We compare ourselves with many education systems, even in the, in, in the um, uh, improvements in recent years in creative thinking, inventive thinking, we can always account for and justify uh, what is so good about our system, um, except for in two, three years uh, ago, I think, Aaron, we were talking about how mental health has now become an indicator that we see uh, to be a very uh, difficult one. Okay, so I've got a, a timer that says that I should move on. <laughs> um, there are three uh, things, actually, uh, Vignesh, that I wanted to, to share. Three different conversations that must be had. Right, One is having heard from and learned from uh, Dr. Ch uh, Chong's book, then what would be different in the way we engage the disadvantaged parents, children, families, right? The parents as well as the children. What would be different if we know that they are not going to come when you meet the parent session is done in an evening or in the afternoon at a time when they have no control over their work. They have no uh, vocabulary. They may not even perceive themselves to be able to have the um, capacity to understand what you're saying in a parent's workshop and so on. So we know this, we talk about this and we try to do our best in order to serve the needs of the families. But how then we do this differently from the understanding of responsabilization and dependence. Secondly, is on um, um, sorry. I wanted to talk about uh, the realities in which uh, schools are operating in, and the first reality is the impossible timetable of Miss Tan. <laughs> so we cannot even talk only about the impossible timetable of Ron, but the impossible timetable of Ms. Tan, right? Um, and, and I'm sure there'll be questions about this. The second reality is that disproportionate amount of resources are still needed. We can always say we have done this, we've got these provisions, we've got FAS, we've got a lot more. We have the SWO, we have the roving um, welfare officer, we have, the, we have the AED, TNL, we have all these things in place. But if we are seeing in the last 20, 30 years that the meritocracy optimism is not happening, is not translating into a reality for these families, then we have to think about 
then what kind of other resources that we need to pump in? And that's a real question that we want, right? Not to criticize, but to really open up and say, what is it that we have to do more? The third reality is that the complexity actually requires the many hands approach, the ministries overlapping, right, in their purpose and intent as well as their resources. So MFS in particular, working hand in hand in MOE, right? Ministry of Finance would feature in this. So if we talk about a residential program for, for um, uh, children, right? Whose job is it? Well, the teachers say it's not my job, right? So where will the ownership be? And therefore the tension, you know, these things. And yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Molia. I know people have been flashing numbers at you. Uh, but no, we'll have a lot more chance to hear Madam Molia's perspectives. I think now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Alistair Chu, who is an educator, trained in Singapore, worked in Singapore schools, and today is the founder of Find Findings Education, to share a little bit of his thoughts and comments. Alistair, please. One of the ideas that we had uh, when we were training to be teachers and later heads of department is that a lot of us teachers, professionals, we are a bit like navigators in a very wide ocean. And the problem in the wide ocean is that a large boat can always float, but a small one may sink. And damage to a small boat is sometimes irreparable. So what we are looking at is, yeah, the government has provided lots of uh, harbour, lots of food, lots of resources. The problem is sometimes those small boats don't make it back to shore. And I think that maybe one of the ways in which teachers and schools can act as uh, bodies of intervention is a very old model, which is uh, sometimes discredited, is the model of the missionary school. A missionary school has a mission, and that is to go out to seek and to save the lost. Now, this need not be a religious avocation. It can be a societal one. And the thing about it is that if you have a missionary school, which is also an elite school, then you have a contradiction in terms. And that is a thing which very few elite schools like to grapple with. If you talk to them about it, the conversation disappears very quickly. I started off in a government school, Gimo Secondary School, which no longer exists. It doesn't exist because basically the poor people who used to go there are no longer there. Everybody's rich now in that area. So you can see that if you have a lot of um, small boats, sometimes the small boats disappear into the wake of the aircraft carriers. And then the large whales come along and eat whatever food is left in the wake of those aircraft carriers. So is the government not doing a good thing? Are the schools not providing? The schools are providing. It's a very complex ecosystem. And that is why you need navigators and pilots to help the smaller fish and the smaller boats to swim safely to shore. This is one of the things I feel um, strongly about. My second school was a convent school in a neighborhood area. And in that school, that neighborhood school I went to, the light on the hill, it was something that they provided to every student and the teachers were content in those days to stay back till nine o'clock and order pizza in. Why? Because it was community. Mission schools with a sense of mission, they provide community. They don't go home at 5.30 or go shopping at 3 o'clock. But that's maybe something that the generations after me, they, are, they have a more balanced lifestyle. And we can't expect everybody to act like 100% missionary all the time, which is why we should spread the burden around and uh, maybe get more educators and schools who are willing to spend part of their time pursuing this mission. So there are three barriers to overcome. The first one is psychological. It's not just that you have a, a problem with not knowing that something is out there, but maybe you have a problem thinking that such a thing exists or that it's possible for you to get hold of it. So the government gives you all these things and they have lots of forms to fill in and who's got the time to fill all those forms? Ah, forget it, maybe somebody else can help me. And you run around from place to place and the psychic barrier builds because you have a time limit and a wealth limit, which richer families don't have. Secondly, there's a physical barrier. If the school is far away from you, because the nearby school happens to be full of wealthy people who can drive to school and, and who can uh, you know, help out for 40 hours of community service or something like that, then you get pushed out of your nearby school and you have to go to a school further away. That's time, that's effort. And the third thing is a program barrier. 
wow, so many programs, right? Integrated programs, and they're all not the same. And IB programs, and A-level programs, and uh, halfway programs, and all kinds of programs. How are you supposed to find the time to read up on all these things? Isn't there someone to help you? The answer is yes, you know. At MOE, there are people who will help you, but first you've got to get to MOE HQ and go and queue up there. Yeah. So these are the things that all schools and all people, you can find a mission. It doesn't have to be a religious one. It can just be a personal one. If you have more motivation in you, go out and help those who are not so well off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alistair. I think one big challenge also is not just going out and queuing an MOE, it's having the time as a parent. Many of the parents in the groups that we've been talking about today don't have the luxury like we do to take leave to go and stand in MOE and queue during office hours. The days and hours that they spend queuing are income loss. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we come to our last but certainly not least important speaker on the panel today to share his perspectives. We have Mr. Stanley Tan. He is formerly the chair of the NVPC, the National Volunteer and Philanthropic Council. He has been in the social sector for over 35 years and currently chairs Equal Dreams. I think we're really honored to hear from his perspectives as someone who really works very actively on the ground in the nonprofit and social service space. What do you have to share about what we've heard today? Stanley, please. Thank you, Vinish. <clears throat> My only claim to eminence here with all these colleagues is that I'm quite good at being a lousy student. You know? <laughs> I'm not an educator, but I'm a professional student in life. Um, I just want to cover a few uh, key points. I probably don't have the capacity that a lot of you have with so much content to absorb them, so I'm not going to punish you with a lot of content. <laughs> and like all good lousy students, I don't prepare. I tell them that I only know what I'm going to say after I listen to everybody. I can't. I didn't even read her book. I said I'll try to understand her book after listening to her. Um, so three points I want to to share with you all. I I think we all get absorbed in the matter of inequality. Yes, it is a problem. I think, but unless you're God, you know, it's very hard for you to change inequality a lot. We can move it bits by bits. But what we can be very proactive about is to address the issue of inequality, to tackle the effect of inequality so that we minimize it, so that everybody have the possibility of a dignified life. Secondly, I want to suggest that in this topic of education and dealing with those in the disadvantaged area, we are using a lot of traditional uh, perspective of what success looks like. We need to redefine success. In the earlier years, the world celebrated wisdom from people like Lao Tzu and Confucius and Plato and Socrates. Today, we celebrate selfishness by celebrating the likes of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Jack Ma, Pony Ma, I don't know how many more Ma's. Uh, and also we, we celebrate people who are wildly successful for themselves. We don't celebrate people who actually contribute to the community. So we need to redefine success because if we don't, then it's very easy to come to the conclusion that only a percentage of people can be successful, the rest will be failure. Thirdly, it's a little bit on education. I think in the early days, education served in my little mind and illiterate mind three purposes. You know, firstly, it's supposed to help you with literacy. That education today is still doing. Secondly, it helps you with life skill. So that's where the push towards academic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, capability come in. But in the early days, values was a very important part of education. So there's a lot of focuses on how to bring up the whole person. Unfortunately, today, I feel that has been not only diluted, but almost eradicated, that, that financial success is the only value you need to embrace 
and it's the most important value to embrace. So if we want to make a dent in this problem of abject property, poverty, we need to address this. We need to bring back the right perspective. We need to respect that every role got to be appropriately remunerated so that every role can afford a person to live in a dignified way. We need to accept that everyone can be successful. And success in that sense is to be the best version of yourself and not to be better than anybody else. Okay. And if we can do that, then all the effort we are doing is going to bear a lot more fruits because all of us are going to start life believing that every one of us can be successful rather than destined for failure just because of your place of birth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we now move to the, what I would personally say is the most exciting part of today's session, which is our conversation, our dialogue with everyone who has shared with us so far. I know, unfortunately, we have a limited size stage, but both Charlene and Aaron will be happy to also answer questions. But before I take questions from the floor, and this is my privilege because, well, as moderator, I don't get paid to do this, so I get to ask more questions. I think I would just like to touch on a comment that both Stanley and Alistair made, and it's sort of building on this idea of recognizing a variety of merits. Stan, uh, Alistair spoke a lot about the traditional idea of a missionary school and the role that educators play. I don't think we can ever argue with the fact that our educators are one of the best trained in the world. Becoming a, a teacher in Singapore is challenging. It's not easy to get into the system. And they're well given a pretty good education, a good training at NIE, and access to a lot of professional development. But something has changed, right? When you are a teacher, they stayed till 9 p.m. And they were happy to do that. And this is where I want to sort of ask and, and sort of prompt the thing that is it because the value as a society, do we have we stopped valuing service to the community? Has this concept of meritocracy, of deservedness, change the narrative where Singapore now, we see ourselves and we say, you know, success is about myself, right? It's about celebrating the Elon Musk and the Jeff Bezos of the world, right? And it's transactional. You want something from me? What are you going to give me? Because as a society, have we become too transactional? And are we now seeing that almost a sort of pinnacle of pragmatism and transactionalism being played out in the way the attitudes that some of our educators may hold towards giving back to the community and society. Uh, leave it to the smart one. I was a terrible student too, with lots of fails. Anyway, um, I think that when it comes to teachers having a balanced lifestyle. I received two very good pieces of advice from senior teachers when I was young. And one of them said, you should work harder when you're a young man, because later on when you're old and you want to work and they don't want you to work, you will feel the pain. I, I didn't know this until I retired. Secondly, the other advice that Sister Maria and then my principal gave me was, a young man should bear the yoke in his youth so that when he's old, he should not regret it. And these two pieces of advice were, were, came in parallel. I don't know whether they buck out or what, but essentially they were saying, you work hard now and later on you can relax a bit, but you will still have a role. If you don't work hard now, then later on you won't even have that role. So what you have will be taken from you as well. You see, my third school was a Methodist school, so they just reinforced it further. And if you work in mission schools a lot, sometimes there are lessons to be learned. Sometimes. Um, oftentimes, uh, when school leaders uh, gather and talk about, you know, the challenges uh, uh, as, as we do now, um, we also talk about the generation of teachers. We ask if there was a difference in terms mm. of uh, their, uh, their ethos as well as their desire to be the teacher that uh, is not only concerned with the academic um, uh, successes of the children, but as well as the values mm. you know, that they invite, the character that they will build up when uh, they are in our in our hands. And um, we we realistically look at the profile of the teachers, the qualification, uh, as well as um, 
uh, the changing aspirations of teachers. I don't think they are less concerned with values. In fact, values are really big in school, not just on the wall, but we talk about it, we try to, we, we apply it and we remind ourselves and we use um, a lot of um, um, things to remind what are the core values of the school. And we embed that in the way we counsel the students, we embed that in the way we praise teachers, we embed that in our recognition system, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So why is this perception that we seem to be spending less time and effort in terms of values um, development in children? Uh, so I would argue that there is no less emphasis, but probably what has overtaken um, the role of the teacher um, is the complexity of the role of the teacher himself. It's not just a teacher of math or not just a teacher of English, but a teacher of life skills, right? a teacher of innovation, a teacher of um, future skills, and so on and so forth. And in this complexity, uh, the teachers spend um, a lot of time trying to um, navigate the landscape. All right, their development time, their assessment time, their conversation time, their creation time, as well as their marking papers time. So this, this, this is what I mean by looking at the impossible timetable of the teacher. So I, I want to assure Stanley there is no less. Now, in recent years, in the last three years, we are the whole society has been talking about the implementation of the revised character education and, and uh, um, curriculum, citizenship curriculum. And it's happening. And there's a lot of time spent in not only building resources, but in, in training teachers in order to be authentic in the way um, they see uh, the rollout of the, the revised curriculum lots of authentic interactions with the children uh, and therefore lots of time so all these would mean a lot more time demand on the time of the teachers so the plate has not quite reduced expanded um and and that's the challenge that we have i think the chai Peng analogy for those of us who have been following the news of the uh, valedictorian I, I think that was very meaningful stanley would you have anything to add yeah I, i'll be very happy to to be wrong in my assessment about you know education having uh, less emphasis on value. Yeah, you know, in in sort of uh, I have a lot of friends I know who work very hard and trying to achieve a lot of and trying to own a lot. But I always remind my friends that you know you got to decide whether you are the master of your assets or the asset is your master. And very often the asset become the master and that applies to teaching too when you try to measure yourself based on the measurable where the most important part of your work is the unmeasurable you can let the process overtake the mission and i don't i don't i'm not trying to say that the teachers lack the effort of trying to do that but they have been forced into a focus that does lead them to produce the right kind of result that should be given. Thank you. I think we have questions from the floor. I see we have Chan Hung, Vishwa. But could we have some microphones being passed around? So maybe Chan Hung first and then Vishwa. Could you all please use the microphones when asking your questions uh, so that our audience from Zoom can hear? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the gentleman there. Hi, uh, very good morning. My name is Chan Hong. I work in a policy advisory firm. I have two questions that I'd like to open up to the panelists, uh, as well as Charlene and uh, Aaron. Um, the first one is, I think some of you talk about uh, space, right? So rental flats, you know, kids in uh, living in a very cramped uh, housing environment, one room uh, rental or smaller. So um, would you think that this would sufficiently address and arrest the issue about inequality if you make housing uh, a minimum size? So like a minimum wage, you know, say a three room flat, you know, to be the minimum size for rental. Uh, do you think that would address uh, some of these issues that we talk about, you know, on inequality, on uh, education? Uh, if not, why not? Right. The second question I have, uh, I think it's pretty much based on what uh, all of you have discussed. Uh, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm not in education, but it sounds like there are two issues here, right? So one is 
uh, what kind of support that you gave to low-income, vulnerable uh, kids, you know, to help them uplift their, their education pursuits, right? So uh, whether it's uh, subsidies or, or um, you know, guidance and assistance and so on, right? And I think the other side of the coin is about uh, what may be some of the existing systems that we have or policies that actually help to entrench the benefits of the well-to-do families, right? So I think you talk about mission, maybe not mission schools, but elite schools, right? And how that system kind of uh, encourage uh, the well-to-do families to be even well, better well-to-do, right? In, for their, you know, their offerings. Um, myself, I'm wondering whether, you know, what would be other potential areas that potentially could have... Um, you know, further help to you know, help them to entrench their, their advantages, like maybe the scholarship system, right? So the fact that you have a lot of bursaries to the needy families, do you even still need scholarship system? Because at the end of the day, uh, the majority of those who end up being scholarship recipients are from well-to-do families, right? So, so maybe, um, you know, a question to all of you, like are there potentially other kind of um, um, uh, policies uh, or programs that we have in Singapore that actually help to entrench the benefits uh, that well-to-do families continue to get you know, for their kids and the next generation. So these are two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anu. Would you like to quickly answer some of these questions? Actually, I, I, I prefer to uh, not look at the um, things that entrench the benefits of the high income, but rather the difficulties of bringing the lower income uh, and the, the more challenged families to be up to speed to, to the, the high income. And, and this is about not only in terms of resources, no table, you know, uh, squeeze into uh, how many people in the room to sleep, etc. It's not just, just physical, but the whole ecosystem in the family, the conversation, the quality of conversation, the, the, um, what they talk about, what uh, they are stressed about, uh, what um, their entire lives uh, focus on solving the kind of problems that they have, uh, which are really difficult problems, day-to-day -day problems, uh, not long-term. The conversation between husband and wife are not necessarily, uh, I'm not suspiciously about independence and about, you know, politics and about intelligence and future 21st century skills. But it's about if I don't go grab today, that means lunch tomorrow is not going to be there, right? So the, the conversations between the parents, the conversation with the children, are not the conversations that you would say um, lend itself to inventive thinking and critical thinking. Uh, but what is more worrying is if knowing this is so, how do we then provide them that ecosystem in order to compensate uh, the lack or the absence of such quality, quality conversations that would open up their minds and that would stretch their, their thinking ability. And um, uh, in schools, we, we have a lot of programs, but I, I think there is a conversation to be had among teachers on how we can be spending a little bit more on looking at um, the, the segment of students who are not even ready for project work at the level where the mass of the student population is. So there is a lot of effort that, that must be pre, uh, what do you call that? Um, 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 upstream before you get to the level where the mass programs of enrichment, project work, innovation, maker space, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, uh, can benefit these children. There's a lot of work to be done before they reach the level where such mass programs can be done. Yeah, I think sometimes you make assumptions on the foundational strength. Before we go to a few questions, a uh, few more questions I see coming from the floor and online. Quickly, uh, maybe both Stanley and Alistair, any perspectives in terms of what we could do to get rid of some of these entrenched privileges for those from better off families? I mean, the moving of ACS to Tenga is certainly one such uh, attempt at trying to address some of this inequality. Uh, maybe both of you all, your quick thoughts on that. Uh, Stanley first, maybe? I, I think uh, I share the view that uh, the entrenched privileges isn't the problem, you know, uh, because access is there. The difficulty today is helping those from the subsector of, uh, uh, of those who are trapped in poverty leverage as much as they can from the access to the system. Um, so that requires a whole host of uh, tools that is needed. Uh, so I won't try and answer all of them or we'll be here all day, uh, <laughs> but I just want to give one perspective that as much as we need many tools, 
is the application of the tools that, has, that are critical. Mm. Do we apply the tool that bring about empowerment to those who are helping or creating a sense of dependency? Therefore, they can't do it themselves. Uh, I think if you can empower people, they are able to cope. The human being is very acceptable. Thank you. Do we teach them to fish or give them a fish? Alistair, any perspectives? Because we have one more question in Chang Hoon's part that I would like answer to. I think that uh, spreading out the schools to the far, further reaches of our civilized uh, polity <laughs> is a good idea. I think ACS moving to Tanga is a good move. I think that elite schools should be spread out as far apart as possible. I think that this is because if you if you look at oh it's Bukitima you know all the good schools are there therefore I will pay ten million dollars for a semi-detached house and I will live there and so my kids will all go there. Well, if there are good schools everywhere in Singapore, then it will even out the gradient. And so you won't have these uh, huge inequalities between one region and another, perhaps. Thank you. I think very quickly, there was a question about minimum housing size that we have not gotten to. So I'm going to very quickly ask each of our panelists, and I think both Charlene and Aaron also, please chime in if you have a perspective. Yes or no, would a minimum size for our housing, especially our rental housing, make a difference to the lived experience? Quick answer. Not going to demand yes or no like some people do, but a uh, quick one. I think the issue is not about uh, having a, a minimum size, you know, a housing size, but it's about creating the right environment, mm. right, for the student to study. And this reminds me of my uh, NIE colleague's work, Lo Chini, right? She's mm. been studying uh, the design spaces of libraries and schools, right? I think this could be a way forward for. Uh, low-income families who do not come from very friendly uh, home environment, yeah. they could make use of the school libraries and um, do their study there. Uh, and I think uh, Chini has actually spoken quite a fair bit to the media about this. And I think this could be, you know, uh, a way of helping low-income families. So my answer is, no, it's not about, you know, uh, having a three-bedroom. It's about having the right environment, a study environment, a conducive studying environment. Charlene, anything you would like to add? Um, I think like the, the assumption and the question that education is uh, very interconnected with many other things is the right assumption. Um, so I set out to ask questions about education to these families and then ended up telling me about space. And they're talking about hunger, like they don't have enough food to eat, so they're hungry. Uh, so I think it's right to, that we think about education as never just about education, but as about like a, a range of circumstances that surround the child. Um, and one thing that young people did mention was that having physical space in schools was helpful. So they found it impossible to concentrate without their little siblings running around, but, but they said um, they appreciated that schools provided that space. Um, so I think that's something that would be good to maintain or like build on having that kind of physical space provided in schools for disadvantaged young people outside of school hours. Thank you, Charlene. Anything from our panelists on that topic of minimum physical space? Stanley? I'll say something. I, short answer to you is yes. You know, I'm a simple boy, so I can follow rules, you know. <laughs> it's not that bad at school. And, and I wanted to sort of uh, uh, just comment that I think if I have been if I've been placed into an ACS or RI at a time when this late 60 and early 70, you would have destroyed me. I'll feel like a real failure. So don't think that it's suitable for everyone. Everyone is different. Thank you. All right. I think Vishwa, Sandra, Raman, there are a lot of questions. So maybe Vishwa, you had your hand up first, maybe. Thank you. Yeah. We'll, we'll take, I think let's take two questions, Vishwa and Sandra, and then let the panelists respond. Thank you, Mignesh. Uh, this is a wonderful way to spend a Saturday morning. I wasn't sure when I came in, uh, but thank you very much, panelists and speakers. Um, I, I don't think we can fix all the problems with the meritocracy issue. It's the best of the inefficient systems, ineffective systems we have in the world. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's try and make the best of it, and which is why I like the sentiment expressed by Stanley. You know, uh, it, the government has emphasized that we should equalize opportunities, not outcomes. I don't disagree with that. I think 
On the other hand, we should dignify outcomes. I think that's important. And what do I mean by dignify outcomes? We need to give dignity to people regardless of the outcome, in spite of the outcome, because of the outcome. You know, in that regard, I think one of the most important things that needs to happen in schools is young people should be socialized to understand, empathize, admire, respect, love people who are different from them. And that can only come about when you increase interaction, meaningful interaction. And very often the meaningful interaction takes place in schools, which is why, Alistair, I love your point about mission, which is why I'm, 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 I'm really wondering why I'm saying this. I have great admiration for SGI because of that. Are you from SGI? No. No. <laughs> I'm from RI. So we are arch enemies. That's why I'm saying, I'm wondering why I'm saying this, right? You see, in RI, you have very similar people. We all come from the band of academic performance. But when you look at SGI, You've got Paikya, you've got gangsters, you've got fellows who don't do very well academically. Then you've got the brilliant guys. And they all work together. I have great admiration. Some of my best friends are from SGI. The guys we used to whack in the rugby pitch are today some of my best friends because they've been socialized well early in life. They've got a natural propensity for sympathy, empathy, love, affection, all of those things, and respect for someone who's different from you. So instead of trying to equalize outcomes, which will never happen, societies are not made that way. Let's dignify outcomes. Let's imbibe in people that sense, as Sandley suggest, suggested, values, but I'm not sure about what values mean. But my point is, Focus on things that are within our means. In that respect, I have one recommendation. It's often taboo to talk about affirmative action. It's taboo, right? It often doesn't work out very well if you look at the US, for example, affirmative action. But I do think the time has come to get rid of elite schools. I say it because I was from an elite school and it doesn't serve us well. Why should we have elite schools? Why should some schools have the pick of the best performers in PSLE? Why? Why can't all school, all secondary schools be required to take in students from 200? That's it. And you, you, you say that every school has to take in a certain certain number of students with a certain grade. You equalize it, then you will have the intermingling. But if you don't have the socialization and intermingling early in life, 20 years down, we'll be having the same conference, the same problems, because it's not going to go away. Because human beings by nature are selfish. Thank you very much, Richard, for that sharing. But just to remind you, about many decades later since you left school, St. Andrews is at the top of rugby, not SGI or RI. As St. Andrews boy, I must say that. Uh, Sandra, you had a question for our panelists yeah. or a comment to share? Um, I don't, yeah, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say a little bit about the research uh, being done in Harvard. Um, we, we talked about ACS move to Tengah. And uh, there is a lot of research uh, from, a, from this team called Opportunity Insights, uh, which shows that when kids from the lower SES attend schools uh, where there are kids from the higher SES, there's a lot of benefits to them. Uh, and a lot of this, it, I mean, part of it is being in an environment where you have higher literacy skills. And, the earlier, the better, even in terms of preschool, right? Uh, better uh, language spoken, 
uh, numeracy skills, but really what, what makes the difference is that their aspirations rise. You know, the, the, the kids around them uh, want to uh, do well in life. Uh, their parents have high expectations of them. And as a result, their own aspirations rise. I recently met up with Adrian Tan, a teenage textbook lawyer. Mm. Um, he was, uh, he wrote a blog once saying that the best thing that happened to him was his mom picked up his name out of the ballot for ACS primary. He used to live in a, in a three room flat. He wasn't poor, poor, but he was poor. Uh, and um, because his mom wanted him to go to ACS because ACS, you know, all the boys, they speak such good English, right? Um, so he, he made it to ACS because his mom picked out his name in, in the ballot. And he said the first day he went to school, he came back and he told his mom, mom, everyone speaks such good English, you know, I must improve my English. But he says his whole trajectory, he wouldn't be a lawyer, he uh, wouldn't have become a lawyer, if not for the fact that he went to ACS. Everyone was working hard. Everyone wanted to go to the best school, RI, <laughs> uh, ACS Independent and so on. And um, so he, he got lifted uh, by everyone's other's aspirations and hard work and so on. And even his mother, he said, so he said when he went to uh, secondary school, he wanted to go to a top school. In secondary school, he wanted to go to a JC. And then after that, it was medicine or law. So that can have a very powerful uh, effect, not just on the kid, but their parents as well. So don't discount, uh, you know, uh, this thing about whether these kids should go to some of these schools. I've always argued for the breaking up of the Bukit Tima belt of schools because, um, yeah, so at the moment that there are not many yeah. HDB flats. I recently called a school, I uh, won't name the school. They couldn't find me a single student who's from a lower income and who's on FAS. A whole school, mind you, a popular school and they couldn't find a single student. And that surprised me. Um, I also would be interested in looking at um, the, the data on schools like Rosyth Primary, uh, which was moved to Cheng San, if you all remember, it's Rangoon North because it was an election promise. Uh, that if they vote PAP, they will get Rosyth <laughs> Primary there. And uh, why I'm interested in that, in that school, the makeup of the student, because there are one room HDB yeah. flats there. And I think the, they do have a better, better diversity in terms of SES. And I'm very curious to see the, the kids from the lower SES who went to Rosyth, what are their outcomes yeah. as opposed to those who went. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sandra. I'm also very, very conscious of time, but to a few quick comments, I think on Rosyth, I was a product of Rosyth, I was still in Rosyth. If they stayed there, it would be an opposition ward. But I can say the best thing that ever happened to me in my education was doing badly in my PSLE and ending up in St. Andrews. It changed my life and it, I am nowhere as successful as Adrian, but it allowed me to do what I do today. Ladies and gentlemen, I know many of you in this room have a lot that you want to share. But I think we can continue a lot of this conversation after we end the stream. So what I'm going to do is take a lot of the questions that we have online first, and we can continue our dialogue after the stream ends. We have some lunch for everyone who joined us in person. So I think here we have a couple of questions. Very quick one was, Charlene, there's a question directed at you. What's the motivation to write this book? The motivation to write this book? Yeah. Um, so. So I grew up in Brunei, which is um, a country that's a small country that's not far from Singapore, very different to Singapore, though. Um, and I kind of grew up with a vantage point of um, because like my family would go to Singapore quite often. So we would go past Singapore sometimes to go um, uh, to travel and so on. And I saw that Singapore is a very successful system and a very different system to Brunei. Um, so it kind of intrigued me uh, kind of this uh, and themes, I think that also, I mean, these are themes that maybe like subconsciously started as a child, but then they, they kind of, you know, bore on into like a PhD and in a book after that, uh, which is that 
on the one hand, there's like, it feels like there's so much to be proud of in this country and they've achieved so much um, in such a little, in such a short amount of time. And at the same time, I was, I had this feeling of intrigue and questions about um, other kinds of like discourse that was coming out, uh, including a discourse around like st the stressfulness of it, uh, the um, uh, like reported suicide and so on, but that was what kind of what people were, um, like kind of people around me were telling me about these things. So I had these like simultaneous kind of like narratives in my mind. Um, and then so I went on to do my undergraduate and then I started to study that through research. Then I went on to do a, a PhD and a book based on that. Thank you very much for sharing your perspectives on what motivated you to put this together, Charlene. There's a question from our Facebook audience. How can we strengthen civic responsibility of cooperation and collaboration in schools? Does the competitive culture in schools exasperate the problem? And if we promote it in schools, will it help to reduce some of the competitive culture in our society? From our panelists, and then maybe if Aaron and Charlene have something to add. Definitely, if you talk about the uh, yeah, CC implementation, all the aspects of civic responsibility, collaboration, uh, and so on are, are in the syllabus. Um, the point I want to get to very quickly is that, uh, like I, I said earlier on, that there's very little room to criticize uh, for what the education doesn't have. The only thing that I feel very strongly about, it is the last mile. It is about the interface between the teacher and the child, the teacher and the parent, the language used, the, the sincerity, the time spent, uh, and so on. So not about social mixing, because in terms of structures, we have social mixing. mixing. We have opportunities for schools of different status and, and, and profiles actually mix and do things together. But that doesn't um, bring about automatically uh, an understanding of each other's uh, social background. Uh, so to me, the teacher is still very, very key. The mic's on, please. Do you have anything you would like to add, Stanley or Alistair? <laughs> felt compelled to add something. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel, you know, uh, bringing out a child involves the whole of community. And of course, teachers play a key role. Parents must never lose their role. But community in Singapore isn't doing enough. Uh, you know, when you have a successful government, civil society have very little space. We should try to claim it back. This time we claim back our civil society. I know this Prof Ko might have stepped up. But there's a student of his, and I think this is an interesting question. Do you believe that a disadvantage and inherent lack of institutionalized capital, thereby shaping stereotypes like ITE for lower performing and disadvantage and JC only for the expiring? So the question really hinges on institutional capital. And do you think that those from disadvantaged backgrounds are an inherent lack of it? And this is being replicated through generations? Nodding along, I guess, agreement? I, I think, as I said earlier, we need to redefine success. You know? uh, we, need, we, we need to stop uh, uh, so putting things into pigeonhole. Mm. Uh, it doesn't mean that if you go to IT, you can't be successful. But as uh, a young country that moved from what we call third world to first world, it's a natural approach to take. I think the past have been successful, but the way we did the past doesn't guarantee a success for the future. We need to change it. I want to quickly say that um, if, if the, the um, attitude um, from, from the school and from the parents surrounding the idea that we have the best education system in the world um, is like, there's not, there's not much room or there's nothing wrong with the system and teachers have that attitude, then we, we have a danger of then um, saying the responsibility is yours, therefore, right? There's not much more I can do. We have given you the best, therefore it is your responsibility to do this. And that to me is a very dangerous one because um, it may lead to uh, unknowingly us preparing uh, those who are not leveling up for working class skill set and mm. therefore perpetuating and you know up the levels it will never change if the attitude is that the Singapore system, uh, uh, education system is the best therefore I don't need to question it as a parent that is also very dangerous because it will entrench the belief that 
Yeah, so it means that we have a good system, everything is done, but it's just me, la. it's just my children. You know, it's just us and we can't level up. So we have to be happy with where we are. So I, I think in both ways, that attitude is really, really quite dangerous. Do we have any other opinions to add on that before I move to the last Well, I think last the, there is a role for the state to play in evening things out. And I think that some tension can be preserved. Um, just now you said, let's eliminate elite schools. I, I think there will always be an elite, and I think they will always find a space for themselves because they have the power and wealth to do it, and you're not getting rid of that anytime soon. But what I feel is that the government is a very powerful counterweight to that in some ways, and um, if they encourage that kind of counterweighting, it will help. So for example, we've seen schools like Bukit Panjang Government High School, we've seen many of the primary schools uh, or the less well-known schools in neighborhoods suddenly become the big school in that neighborhood. Look at Henry Park. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you know, and there is a school with a reputation. But along the way, little manipulations like that are actually counter manipulations against the elite. It's a very delicate dance that, that urban um, city-state type societies play because we are the last remaining full city-state in the world, you know. The others are Monaco and Vatican City, or they are satellites of the PRC these days. So if you look at it, it's not easy to keep a city-state going. It's not easy to make a national city-state going. And our delicate dance is very reminiscent of city-states like uh, Venice, mm. which is part of our social studies syllabus now <laughs> because it collapsed. And I hope that our government is able to dance that dance well enough to keep the churn going so that people are always able to find an advantage, able to find their way up into success. It's difficult to flatten it completely because you flatten it completely, any science teacher will tell you that no chemical reaction can occur. There's no delta. There has to be a bit of a delta and there has to be enough incentive, enough assistance for people to make that delta, that activation energy, which allows a reaction to proceed. So maybe not so elite, elite schools, but still there will be. Yeah. That's Thank you, thing. Alistair. Okay, I think we have one last very interesting question online, and I think we have, we'll take two closing questions from the audience. I'm going to ask the last question on behalf of one of our online guests, and I apologize if I paraphrase it a little bit inaccurately. But the question is about mental health, and I know we as a, a team before today's session spoke extensively <laughs> about this. Mental health for our students, are we doing enough in our schools? Can more be done? And especially for those from challenged backgrounds, they do not have resources and access to mental health is very costly in Singapore. What more can we do to help them? Okay, you're looking at me and because it's in school. Uh, the, the answer to the question is, are we doing a lot? Yes. Are we doing enough? No. Um, and again, it is not just it's not resources and it's not about that. It is a whole complex gamut of things of the timetable of the teacher capacity of the teacher's commitment of the parent support of the of the availability of their time, the competition for their time and the whole society's pressure on them to to actually do well. Um, in, in my former school, for example, the main stresses of st uh, for, for, for the students in, in P5 are really their self expectation. That is the main stresses, main stressor for their high stress level. It's their self expectation, and you know that self expectation is an extension of their parents' expectation. And 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 if that is the case, then the, the there is no simple way of of helping them with it, um, except for giving them the lived experiences that will take them away from believing that that's the only way that they can succeed. Thank you. Aaron? I just want to make a point about uh, our current hot button issue about youth and mental health. I'm currently doing some work together with Daniel Goh and a few other collaborators from Australia. We are editing a special issue on mental health and education. And what we found is that um, I wouldn't want to say that, uh, I'm, well, I'm not an expert on mental health, but I think there's a dominance of medical medicalized discourse about mental health which um, we think it's uh, overriding other possibilities of why um, our students are depressed or they cannot cope with life. 
because I, I think there are deep underlying issues uh, why our students are depressed or they are not coping well with life, you know, that there could be so many, many, many reasons, right? But what it's being perpetuated in our system is that, okay, you are mental, let me send you to see a counsellor. Okay, if you're still not well, we'll see you to send you to see a psychiatrist. But I don't think this is the way it should go because some of our students basically just need some attention. What they, they, may, what they need may, could be some love and attention, right? They, they, could be, uh, have, they could have many other issues, right? They, they may not need to be medicalized, you know? Mm. So this is what uh, uh, my whole issue, it's special issue is all about. It'll be coming out in later part in this year. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. And do everybody keep a lookout for the special issue of the journal. I think there were some questions online. Unfortunately, we don't have the time today to answer. I think there are particularly some interest around the special education space in Singapore, the SPET space. I think maybe that can be a future conversation that we could reimagine. But I just want to give an opportunity to two people in the audience, Raman and Changda, who had, I think, quick comments and questions to share. So maybe just make it, make it short so we could pass Raman a mic. Do we have a mic for Raman? No, we can't hear you on Zoom, yeah. Hi, I'm Raman. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, I represent an organization called Octava Foundation, and we recently did um, a white paper on disadvantage gap in education in Singapore. And I just wanted to say that we, we saw very complementary themes that came out of what, what um, Dr. Cheong discussed today and, and what we found. So I, I had one comment and one question for Dr. Cheong. The comment is, I, I completely agree with what you've said, Biswas, around um, dignifying outcomes and equalizing the leveling field. There's a missing component around equity. Yeah. Um, and schools, just the default of being working towards an average and working towards an average cannot be an equitable system. So it, there's an inherent um, system issue there around how much can we, how much can we work on equity. And therein lies the role of the community and the, the, what happens outside of the MOE systems of how do we create that equitable availability, equitable access to the available opportunities. So I think there's a whole piece around social um, and the communities that, 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 that is under addressed right now to, to make the system really work for all. Um, but I also wanted to just ask one question specifically because parents is a really important lever and you've had an opportunity, Dr. Cheong, to interview parents. And I wanted to get a context on, so what we found in our study is that there is a lack of aspiration or there is a disparity in educational aspiration for children in, in parents who are coming from low income. Did that appear in your context? Because while they feel they feel grateful for the education system. Do they aspire for their children in that education system is a, is a slightly different frame. Um, and the second is the role of the parent as a co-educator. And that comes to the role of a parent outside of school. What happens around learning outside of school is an important role because school, primary school, for example, ends at one. There's a full day after that almost uh, to be done. So what is the role of a parent as a co-educator and can the target demographic that we're talking about today, how are we enabling them on this co-educator, co-educator journey? And in COVID, they were probably the primary educators, right? All of our parents, we turned into primary educators over that school shutdown time. and and. How are we enabling learning at home that goes beyond the conversation about do they have enough space, do they have enough books, but how do we enable this co co educator role um, that we that that is outside of the MOE system. Thank you very much Raman. Thank I you. cannot at the 1pm like a primary school or my Facebook like Charlene you want to quickly answer the questions before we let uh, Oh, sorry so Changda's comments are related so I'll just let Changda. Thank you. I, th I think it's very related to what uh, Raman has, has spoke about. I think there are two critical points that within the discussion, I think we 
probably needs to give a lot more attention to. But let me start with this a little bit thought-provoking quote by a certain person named George Santayana. He says, a child educated only at school is an uneducated child. And we've talked a lot about, um, especially in Charlene's work and understanding um, this families, low uh, economic background families in navigating with, with the school. But, and, and that also relates to Stanley's point about rethinking what is success. I, I just have like three um, questions to, to sort of ponder upon. Are schools providing a comprehensive education beyond just the literacies and, and preparing students to get a job? at the end of this. And how do parents, especially in this, uh, uh, perhaps Charlene can share a little bit more from, from your work dealing with these parents, how do they see the notion of education? Is it just going to school or is there a much broader understanding of education? And that is fundamental for us to then redefine the question of success, right? What is then the end goal that parents from such background has? Because it then, what mindset they have about education to then translate not only how they interact with the schools, but what kind of mindsets would they put in place in educating their, their child at home through the non-school uh, approach of education. I think that, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah thank you both for, for those um, comments and questions. Um, around the so there's the the common thread of the role of the parent in um in schooling uh, so th th there's a chapter in my book that just kind of talks about that in detail so parents roles in their children's education uh, because while they depended a lot on the schools that wasn't to say that they um that they had no like agency um either um what they did flag was that it's difficult to be a co-educator and that they would like to have the time and the space to do that, but they don't have that time um, or the space to do that. Um, they mentioned that self-help groups provided parenting classes that they were grateful for. So they would tell them, like, what should you feed your child? What time should they go to bed? Um, and like they um, uh, and, and like deeper questions um, in addition to that as well, which they appreciated. Um, so I would say like the desire to be a co-educator like I saw in my data, uh, but whether the kind of structures and conditions that they live in allow that to actually actualize is a different question. Around the aspirations question, um, at an abstract level, they had very high aspirations. They, they felt like education could help them go from earning $2,000 a month to $10,000 a month. So that was what one mother communicated to her child. Uh, so at the abstract level, they believe that education could do that uh, but when they talked at, at a more concrete level, they didn't want to go to JC. You know, they didn't want to go to like the um, what uh, what was commonly understood as like the most straightforward routes to junior college because they could see upfront like the challenges that they would face once they got into it. Um, and there were comments around the um, like meritocracy um, and like the um, how we can um, like not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and I like um, what you said, Vizwa, about like, it's important that our system allows like opportunity to rise, but even for those who don't rise, there's dignity of outcomes. Um, and one way that there is dignity of outcome, that we can kind of foster dignity of outcomes is through mingling, socializing, um, as you mentioned. One thing that I brought out in my book as well uh, is the concept of interdependency. So meritocracy um, provides a more hierarchical frame of seeing society. It's, one, it's, it's perhaps one lens through which we can um, try to think about fairness, but another kind of frame that, I mean, maybe we could add another framework to our, to our toolbox of thinking about fairness, which is the concept of interdependency, where we're kind of learning from each other and respecting each other, uh, regardless of what kind of social class or um, any other kind of um, social background that we come from. Thank you very much, Charlie. Ladies and gentlemen, I am literally being inundated with messages being told that I need to stop this. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I think this is a very rich conversation. Please join me in thanking our panelists for sharing with us. Those of us in the room will continue the conversation after we finish the formalities online. So thank you very much to our three panelists, to Charlene and to Aaron, for their insights and their perspectives. Before we round up today's session, 
I'd like to invite the founder of Best of You, Su Hong, to make his short closing remarks while maybe we'd like to go back to our seats. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for staying until so late. Um, uh, and thank you very much for the speakers as well. This was a really wonderful discussion. I will try my best to close. It's extremely difficult because the conversation is complex and so rich. Um, I, I lived in Canada for 12 years uh, and before coming back to Singapore. And one of the reasons why I started Conversations Reimagined was because when I came back to Singapore, I felt that there were so many things that, you know, that needed changing. I was a foreign migrant worker in Canada, and I felt that they, they had this spirit of uplifting the foreign migrant workers, even though, you know, it's still patchy there. And when I came back here, I felt that there wasn't this conversation. And one of the things that that sparked or inspired Conversations Reimagined was really trying to tip, uh, tilt the scales, uh, tip some of the scales in the right direction and uh, redistribute some of the power and authority of um, the, the power to some of the um, other stakeholders. Um, in today's conversation, I felt that a lot of the, well, it's about education, but a lot about what, uh, how society can solve the problems of inequality is really through education. But it seems like the timetable of education is already quite impossible. What about the rest of the other stakeholders? What about those? What about the corporations? What about the elite schools or the people that come up from the elite schools? I absolutely agreed with you, sir, um, about dignifying outcomes. Um, I don't quite agree with you about the, 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 the baby in the bathwater, though, because I think the baby has produced a lot of things in the bathwater that we have to throw out. And um, meritocracy being one of them. Um, one of the things I find very challenging about meritocracy was that is that it, it starts with very flawed assumptions to begin with, that we all begin on a level playing field when we actually don't. And the, the other thing about meritocracy that I worry about is that the outcomes of meritocracy for citizenship is that it casts society into winners and losers. And it's very hard for any society to deliberate about methods about inequality progress and development if we are just winners and losers. Um, so in the spirit of con continuing this conversation, I think one of the beautiful things about Conversations Reimagine is that we come to the room together as citizens where, where, where we are not winners and or we're not losers, but we are here together to work for a solution for the entire community. So I want to thank um, the Head Foundation once again for this wonderful collaboration and everyone here today as well for your contributions. Please continue to continue this conversation because it's important for all of us. Thank you very much and have a wonderful, uh, wonderful day, yes. Long weekend. Thank you very much, Su Hong. For those of you who are joining us online, unfortunately, I can't just let you go because we have a little surprise for everyone. But as we prepare the surprise, I think I'm going to take this opportunity to share a little bit of perspectives of what I've heard today, a little bit of our opinions. At the Head Foundation, our dialogue series is an important platform that we use to move the needle. We're not here to give all the solutions. We don't know all the solutions, neither do all the experts in this room. But collectively, can we create a better society for ourselves? Can we create a better society for our children and for future generations? And that's what we hope to do through the THF Dialogues. And I think today's dialogue got us to think about a lot of issues, a lot of issues that are important and meaningful to us, and issues that have been very well summarized. And now is that little gift that we're going to share with everyone. And it's going to appear on screen, I think, in a couple of seconds, or I'm going to look a bit foolish. But it's all right, looking foolish is not a bad thing. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the beautiful graphic recording of what we have discussed today. What are the ideas? What are the, the different challenges that we have faced, right? The in invisibility of inequality, right? The many hands approach. What could we have done differently? An equal start. So ladies and gentlemen, for all those of you who are joining us online, we will be sharing this graphic recording with you. Uh, it will be made, sent to you via, via the email that will thank you and your EDM. Please do participate in the survey. Feel free to use these graphic recordings. Do acknowledge, of course, that this came from the partnership between the Head Foundation and the Best of You in the THF Dialogue and Conversations Reimagined series. But use it. Use it to ponder. Use it to think. Print it up. Put it in your room. You get to see it. Look at my beautiful face too. But put it up. Think about it. Think about these issues. If you're an educator, what more can we do? If you're a parent, what can you do different? 
So as we move towards the end of today's session, I would like to just share a little bit. Like I said, my personal experience, one of the best things that happened to me was doing badly in my PSLE. I went to a very good school. I was very fortunate to come from a family of privilege that allowed me to go to an education in a very good primary school. But I didn't do well. I was one of the worst students in my class. I remember the day I collected my PSLE, I was bursting out in tears. I got sent to St. Andrews. I didn't think I was important what my fourth or fifth choice was. I thought I was just going to my first choice. But I ended up in St. Andrews. But it was the best four years of my life. But it got me to re realize something. And I want to end today's session, especially for those of us who are joining, those of us today who participate in conversations like this, who are in a position to help move the needle, who have succeeded one way or the other. We're doing all right. We can think more deeply about these issues. But remember, not all of it is just our hard work and effort. There are many other external factors that helped us get to where we are. Not lest we forget that those who today are challenged are not because of the lack of trying. And we talk a lot about building a compassionate meritocracy. Compassion is very important and compassion must be shown by those of us who have been fortunate. So I'm just going to end with a quote from the tyranny of merit by Michael Sandel. There, but for the grace of God, or the accident of birth, or the mystery of fate, go I. Remember that those of us who have been lucky and fortunate have to give back if we want to truly build a caring and compassionate society. Thank you very much for joining us, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen.